Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey, hello, and how are you? And welcome to this latest edition of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, where we discuss some of the best moments, best names, and best memories in sports history. I'm Dana Augusta, your host, and I sincerely hope you're having a good day, good evening, or good night, wherever and whenever you're listening. And we're back again with another show highlighting the best in sports history. And I appreciate each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy day to give us a quick listen. And as a reminder, please subscribe to this podcast if you like what you hear here and check out our Twitter page at Historically SP2 for your daily dose of sports history. Now, on this edition of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, we're going to shine a light on the two teams that recently appeared in the NCAA tournament this past Monday night and the illustrious history of the University of North Carolina Tar Heels and the University of Kansas Jayhawks, as well as the importance of the city of New Orleans and its major role in the history of the Final Four. In our main event portion of the program, we're going to take a trip back to 1957. This year was not the first time that the Tar Heels and Jayhawks met for all the marbles on the court. In 1957, Kansas and North Carolina battled for three overtimes in Kansas City to determine a national champion, which is noted as one of the greatest NCAA tournament finals ever played. In the second part of the show, we usually do a top five memorable moments from the past week in Amazon Sports history. However, for this episode, we're going to take a look at the previous Final Fours that took place in the Superdome. And finally, in our shout-out segment, we're going to take a look at the first Final Four that took place in the Big Easy, a game that gave birth to a basketball legend and had one of the most bizarre endings in Final Four history. So sit back, pump up the volume. You're listening to the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, a proud member of the Sports History Network. The Pigskin Tales Podcast is all about the lesser-known pro football players. Yes, there are stories about the ones we know, like Brad Tarkenton and Harold Red Grange. But have you ever heard of Ernie Nevers? How about Dave Osborne or even Grady Alderman? These men created their own path to the NFL. How did they do it? Listen to the Pigskin Tales podcast. Now streaming on your favorite music platform. Go to pigskintails.com. Hello, and welcome back to the program. I'm Dana Augusta, your host, and you are locked in to the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, where we relive the best that the history of sports could offer, and a proud member of the Sports History Network. The road to the national championship in college basketball ended once again in the southern city of New Orleans, and the two teams left standing after the month-long tournament was the University of North Carolina coached by former player and assistant Hubert Davis, who finished his first season as head coach and trying to win that school's seventh national championship. On the other side was Kansas Kansas University, coached by Bill Self looking to win his second national title at the school and that school's fourth national title. When it was all said and done, the Jayhawks, led by tournament most outstanding player, senior Oshai Obaji, claimed the 72-69 win, erasing a 15-point halftime deficit in the process, the largest deficit overcome in a final game. 
This was not the first time that these blue bloods of college basketball had to compete against each other on the game's biggest and grandest stage. These two giants of the sport faced the off against one another 65 years ago in Kansas City. When it was all over, the Tar Heels and Jayhawks played one of the most memorable games in the history of college basketball. After surviving numerous close games during the regular season, the conference tournament and lastly, a triple, time, triple overtime game against Michigan State in the national semifinal. The battle-tested North Carolina came into the national championship game with an unblemished record of 31-0. Led by head coach Frank McGuire and Helms Foundation College play, Basketball Player of the Year Lenny Rosenbluth, the Toy Heels were ranked number one overall in the AP poll. Meanwhile, Kansas came into the national championship game with just two losses and were led by sophomore phenom and first-team All-American from Overbrook High School of Philadelphia named Wilt Norman Chamberlain. Despite the two losses, however, the Jayhawks entered the game as three-point favorites over the undefeated Tar Heels. Even in 1957, the game attracted heavy media attention with over 10 television stations and 63 news reporters in attendance. North Carolina, led by coach Frank McGuire, was in his fifth season as the team's head coach, and his starting lineup and most of the roster was consisted primarily of players from New York State due to McGuire's connections in the area from his time at St. John's. Tommy Kearns and Pete Brennan were the two offensive specialists, while center Joe Quigg provided a solid presence in the paint and grabbed close to nine rebounds per game. Guard Bob Cunningham was one of the Heels' best defensive players. However, the leader of the team was Lenny Rosenblum, who averaged almost 28 points a game and served as the team's clutch performer. The, the, the Tar Heels entered the tournament and defeated Yale in the opening round of the East Regionals to advance to the semifinals against Canisius. North Carolina won that game by 12, allowing them to move to the NCAA East Regional Final against Syracuse. Playing at the historic Palestra in Philadelphia, Syracuse fell to the Tar Heels 67-58, allowing them to advance to the Final Four in Kansas City. The Tar Heels' opponent in the national semifinal was Michigan State. The Tar Heels tied with the Spartans as the regulation time was winding down. Michigan State Jack Quiggle made a half-court shot that would have given the Spartans the lead, but it left his hands after time expired, nullifying the basket. In the first overtime, Michigan State had a two-point lead with 11 seconds remaining and had a player at the foul line. The Spartans missed both free throws and Carolina's Brennan gathered the rebound and dribbled down the court and made a shot as time expired to send the game to a second overtime. The Tar Heels pulled away in the third to win the game 74-70. The game saw the lead change 31 times before the Tar Heels were able to emerge victorious after the three overtime periods. Waiting for the Heels in a national championship game was Kansas, led by first-year head coach Dick Harp. Kansas began the season favored to win the national title, then this was due in North Park to sophomore Will Chamberlain. At the beginning of the season, the Jayhawks' starting lineup consisted of seniors Gene Elston, Maurice King, John Parker, Lou Johnson, and Chamberlain. Ron, Ron Lineski replaced Johnson in the starting lineup during the season. Hart began the season with a man-to-man -man defense, but later switched to zone defense to give the Jayhawks an advantage and rebounded. In the first round of the NCAA tournament, the Jayhawks defeated SMU 73-65 in overtime with Chamberlain scoring 36. In the regional final, they defeated Oklahoma City University 81-61 in Dallas to reach the Final Four. Chamberlain posted 30 points with 15 rebounds in that contest. The Jayhawks would face two-time defending NCAA tournament champion San Francisco in the national semifinal in Kansas City. Shooting over 60% from the field, the Jayhawks posted an 80-56 win to advance to the championship game against the undefeated North Carolina Tar Heels, the number one ranked team in the country. And even though the Tar Heels were undefeated and ranked number one in the nation, Kansas entered the game as a three-point favorite, mostly because playing in Kansas City, which was close to Lawrence, the school's location, and was virtually a home game. The game began with the tip-off between Kansas' 7-foot-tall Chamberlain and North Carolina's Curtains, who was not even 6 feet tall. 
and employing his own defense and playing and staying out of the lane and connecting on perimeter shots. The Tar Heels exploded out to an 11 to 4 advantage. After a series of defensive changes by the Jayhawks and featuring Chamberlain, offensive, Chamberlain offensively, Kansas climbed back into the game as the first half ended with UNC holding a 29-22 lead. In the opening minutes of the second half, Kansas controlled the tempo and held momentum. The Jayhawks got to within 1 point, 31-30, with a three-point play by Chamberlain. Kansas continued to control the game as they went on a 10-2 run to gain the lead with nine minutes to go in the contest. With the Jayhawks controlling tempo and holding the lead, Carolina coach Frank McGuire was confronted with another problem. His players trying to get Chamberlain on the free throw line was getting into foul trouble because Chamberlain was notoriously poor at the line. With Kansas holding a three-point lead, Coach Harp instructed his team to go into a slow-down game, running the clock and holding that slim lead now, now that loomed large without a shot clock. KU would not attempt a shot for five minutes. With a minute 45 remaining on the clock, Kansas' Gene Elston was fouled by Rosenbluth on a layup attempt. The, the foul was Rosenbluth's fifth, thus fouling out. Elston missed both free throws from the line and Carolina got the rebound. As Jayhawks unable to take advantage of Rosenbluth's absence, scoring only two points before the end of regulation. North Carolina began, then began to rally. Bob Young, who had replaced Rosenbluth after his fifth foul, scored a layup to bring Carolina to within two. North Carolina tied the game at 46 apiece after Kearns hit a pair of free throws in the closing seconds. The Tor, Heels, the Tor Heels got the ball back and held it for one final possession. The ball was passed to Cunningham who missed his initial shot but was able to get the rebound. Cunningham went up for another shot but received, a, received heavy contact from Chamberlain. Yet no foul was called as time ran out sending the game into overtime. In the first overtime session, each team scored one basket, nodding it up at 48 apiece, heading into the second overtime. And the second overtime was highly contested and, and was highlighted by clutch defensive plays, plus also highlighting the overtime period was the altercation between Chamberlain and Tar Heels guard uh, Bobby Cunningham. Neither team would score at all in the second overtime as the score continued to stand at 48 apiece. In the third stanza, Kearns hit a driving layup to give the Heels a 50-48 lead. After a one-minute break between periods, the third overtime began with another jump ball, again won by Chamberlain. After King missed the opening shot of the period, Carolina's Kearns made a right-handed layup to bring the score to 50-48. to Kansas failed to score again, and this time Kearns missed his shot after being fouled, then made both free throws. Off of a pass from Lineski, Chamberlain made a shot, fouled, and made the ensuing free throw to complete the, th complete the three-point play to bring the Jayhawks to within one point. Cunningham was fouled after being trapped on a double team and then missed the first shot on the one and one. The Jayhawks Lineski missed a contested close layup, but King got the offensive rebound and was fouled on a putback. King made the one of one of the free throws that tied the game up once again at 52 apiece. However, on the next possession, John Kansas' John Parker stole the ball and crossed half court when Coach Harp called timeout. Chamberlain received the ball in the post when the ball was put back into play and went up for a shot and received some contact. However, let the referee letting the players play, no call, no foul was called, and then the ball rolled out of bounds off of Carolina. On the next play, Elston was run into by, by a Tar Heel and went to the foul line for two shots. With 31 seconds remaining, he missed the first, he missed the first and made the second shot. Out of timeouts, Carnes drove into the lane and put up a shot that was blocked out of bounds by Chamberlain. The following play, Quick pump fake and went up for a shot that, that Chamberlain blocked. However, simultaneously, King made contact with Quig's body while he was shooting, and the official called a shooting foul. Quig went to the free throw line for two shots with six seconds remaining and made both, giving the Tar Heels the lead at 54 to 53. Kansas called timeout and then bounded to Lineski, who then passed the ball towards Chamberlain, who was under the basket. The pass was overthrown and Quigg tipped the ball away from Chamberlain. Kearns grabbed it and got away from the defender before he threw the ball into the air to run out the clock. 
As time expired and the ball was in the air as the Tar Heels and the Tar Heels won their first ever national championship. Chamberlain led all scores with 23 points while pulling down 14 rebounds. Meanwhile, Rosenbluth led the Heels with 20 points. Following the game, Chamberlain was, however, criticized for his inability to lead Kansas to win a national championship. He later admitted this loss was the most painful in his life, and he returned to Kansas for his junior year and to play one more, another season under Coach Hart. Chamberlain quickly became frustrated with opposing teams' way of playing with them, which consisted primarily of double or triple teaming him to limit his offensive production and effectiveness. In addition, many teams resorted to running out the time on the clock when they had the lead over the Jayhawks to increase their odds of winning the game. Remember, no shot clock back then. After the Jayhawks failed to qualify for the NCAA tournament in 1958, Chamberlain decided to forego his senior year at Kansas to go play with the Harlem Globetrotters. He would not return to Kansas' campus for over 40 years after leaving for the Globetrotters. He finally returned in 1998, the year before his death, when his number 13 jersey was, reti uh, was retired by Kansas. And you ladies and gentlemen, that was this episode's main event, highlighting the 1957 National Championship game between Kansas and North Carolina. Coming up is our top five, and we're going to be talking about five of the six previous NCAA National Championship games that took place in the city of New Orleans. And also, we will be sending a shout out to the first National Championship that took place in the Big Easy 40 years ago this year that was one of the most memorable ever played. So, ladies and gentlemen, please stay tuned. You're listening to the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, a proud member of the Sports History Network. And before we get on with the rest of the show, one sign that we're growing here at the Historically Speaking Sports and the Sports History Network is we have a sponsor, and that is newspapers.com. Now, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a serious sports fan like myself. And if you're into sports history, you definitely need to check out newspapers.com. At newspapers.com, you can get over you can get access to over 640 million pages worth of news from all around the world, from the United States, from Canada, England, Scotland, and so on, dating back as far as, as 1798. Now, get a free one-week subscription to newspapers.com. You can do this by visiting the Sports History Network at sportshistorynetwork.com slash newspapers. And with a paid subscription, you will also be helping to support the production of this and other Sports History Network shows across our network. So that's sportshistorynetwork.com slash newspapers. And also, please check out our Twitter feed at historicallysp2 for your daily dose of sports history. Also, you could drop us a line or two at our email address, which is historically.speaking.sports at gmail.com. And finally, please don't forget to subscribe, to hit the subscribe button wherever you hear this podcast so you get new episodes anytime they come out. And now, this week's top five, and we're going to do something a little bit different here with the top five segment. We, top, we celebrate the top five anniversaries of the best moments in sports history over the past week. But this, what we're going to do is there were six Final Fours, including the one that just, that just happened, in the city of New Orleans, in my home state of Louisiana. And we're saving the first one, which was the 1982 Final Four, for our shout out segment. So please stay tuned for that because I think that was probably the best of the five of the of the six final fours that took place in New Orleans. So we're going to start things off. We're going to we're going to count down in chronological order. 
the Final Four that took place in the city of New Orleans, starting with 1987. That year, in 1987, Final Four featured Indiana, UNLV, Providence, and Syracuse. Indiana, coached by Bob Knight, won the national title with a very slim and exciting 74-73 win in the final over Syracuse, coached by Jim Beheim. It would be the fifth national title for the Hoosiers and his third in 11 years. Keith Smart of Indiana, who hit the game winner in the final se seconds and intercepted the full court pass at the last second, was named the tournament's most outstanding player. The tournament also featured a Cinderella team in the Final Four, which was Providence. Led by then unknown head coach Rick Pitino and a young point guard named Billy Donovan, who would later win the back-to-back -back national championships coaching the University of Florida. It was also the Friars' first Final Four appearance since 1973, where they were led by point guard Ernie DeGregorio. They would lose the national semifinals to Big East rival Syracuse, featuring the likes of Ronnie Cycli and Billy Owens and the aforementioned Coach Beheim. 1993 Final Four, Michigan, North Carolina, Kansas, and Kentucky. North Carolina, coached by Dean Smith, won his third national title in school history and the second under Coach Smith with a 77-71 victory in the final game over Michigan, coached by Steve Fisher, and featuring the Fab Five, which was Chris Weber, Jalen Rose, Ray Jackson, Jimmy King, and Jawan Howard. UNC's Donald Williams was named the tournament's most outstanding player, yet the most memorable play and the one, the one play that everybody talks about dealing with that national championship game was Chris Weber's gaffe when he tried to call a timeout with the team down by two points and, and he was double teamed by North Carolina. Michigan had to use all of his timeouts so Weber's gaffe resulted in a technical foul which sealed the Tar Heels third national championship in school history. The 2003 Final Four which featured Syracuse, Kansas, Marquette and Texas. The Final Four consisted of Kansas who made their second straight appearance in the Final Four. Marquette, led by future NBA All-Star Dwayne Wade, making his first appearance since they won the national championship in 1977. Syracuse, making his first appearance since 96. And Texas, in their first appearance in the Final Four since 1947. Of those four, Texas was the only top seed to advance to the Final Four. The other three that year, Arizona, Kentucky, and Oklahoma, advanced as far as the Elite Eight but fell. Syracuse, led by Carmelo Anthony's 20 points and 10 rebounds, won their first national championship in three tries under Jim Beheim, beating Kansas 81-78 in what would be Roy Williams' final game as head coach of the Jayhawks. He would depart to become head coach at North Carolina, a position he held before retiring after the 2020-2021 season. Carmelo Anthony of Syracuse was named the tournament's most outstanding player. The 2012 Final Four, Kentucky, Kansas, Louisville, and Ohio State. Kentucky making their second appearance in the Final Four under head coach John Calipari, Louisville making their second appearance on the former Wildcat coach Rick Pitino, who had led UK to the national title in 96. Kansas, who making their first appearance since winning it in 2008 national championship under Bill Self by beating Calipari's Memphis team in Ohio State, making their first appearance since their runner-up finish in 2007, and second under head coach Thad Mata. Kentucky led by tournament most outstanding player Anthony Davis, defeated Kansas 67-59 in the Superdome to win their first national championship since Tubby Smith led the team there in 1998. This was Calipari's first national championship and four trips to the Final Four, having previously gone there with Kentucky in 2011, Memphis in 2008, and UMass in 1996. And finally, this past year's Final Four, 2022 Final Four, Kansas, North Carolina, Duke, and Villanova. The Kansas Jayhawks won its fourth national title in school history by erasing a 15-point halftime deficit, beating North Carolina 72-69 in the championship game. It was the largest comeback in championship game history 
giving head coach Bill Self his second national title with J in the Jayhawk program. Senior Ochai Abaji was named the Final Four's most outstanding player for the Jayhawks, scoring 12 points in the final. This Final Four was the first to feature all four teams with multiple national championships. This was Kansas's fourth championship in school history. North Carolina carried with them six national titles. Their arch rival Duke Blue Devils having won five and Villanova having three. While North Carolina was led by first year head coach Hubert Davis, their rival Duke Blue Devils was saying goodbye to their longtime legendary coach Mike Krzyzewski, who was coaching in his final tournament. So that was this week's top five, the five previous, five of the six, I should say, previous national championships and final fours to take place in the city of New Orleans. So coming up next will be the other final four that we didn't talk about, which was, which is actually celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. The final four in 1982, which was the first one ever to take place in the Superdome. So check that out right after this. Listening to the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, a member of the Sports History Network. And we're back with our final segment on the show, which is which is what we call our shout out. Now, this episode, we're going to send a shout out to the 1982 Final Four. The first Final Four ever to take place in the city of New Orleans, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary. Now, you could say that this was a Final Four first. Not only was this the first Final Four in New Orleans, but this was also the first time the tournament would be televised by CBS. From 1969 to 1981, the tournament was broadcast by NBC with lead announcer being Kirk Gowdy and later on Dick Enberg, who was later joined by Billy Packer. With the first year being on CBS, Billy Packer would join Gary Bender to call the Final Four. That year, the four teams that are, would arrive in New Orleans would be Georgetown, led by head coach John Thompson, and freshman Patrick Ewing, who was one of the biggest high school prospects ever. Also making the field was University of Houston and head coach Guy Lewis, and he had an impressive freshman of his own, a center from Nigeria named Akeem Abdul Olajuwon. Also, the Cougars featured another future basketball Hall of Famer in Clyde Drexler. Also in the Final Four was the Louisville Cardinals, who had won the national championship just two seasons earlier in Indianapolis under head coach Denny Crum. The Cardinals were led by Scooter and Rodney McCray, who would later have stellar NBA careers in their own right. And rounding out the Final Four was North Carolina, under legendary Dean Smith, who was looking for his first national championship. The Heels had lost, had last won the NCAA title in 1957, which we earlier talked about, when the Heels outlasted Will Chamberlain in Kansas in triple overtime. The Heels had lost title games in 72, 77, and the season before, 1981, falling to Isaiah Thomas and Indiana Hoosiers in Philadelphia. The Tar Heels were led by forward James Worthy and center Sam Perkins. Also in the lineup was a little-known guard from Wilmington, North Carolina named Michael Jordan. With the star power and future Hall of Famers, this may have been the most star-studded Final Four ever, and taking place in what I call the Playground of Legends, the Louisiana Superdome. In the national semifinals, North Carolina was pitted against Houston. The Tar Heels opened the game with a 14-0 run. Yet Houston overcame the deficit and tied the game at 29, 
just a few minutes before the half. Coming out of halftime, North Carolina went on another run, this time a 7-2 clip, and eventually claimed a 68-63 win after stalling for a significant period of time late in the second half, going for their famous Dean Smith four corners offense and draining the clock without the benefit of a shot clock. In the other national semifinal between Georgetown and Louisville, both teams shot very poorly. The two teams traded the lead several times throughout the first half, but after three minutes into the second half, Georgetown gained the lead and never relinquished it. The Hoyas used their physical defense to maintain their lead and set the pace of the game, which they won 50-46. Finally on that Monday night in the nationally televised final, the game began with a tip-off between Georgetown's Patrick Ewing and North Carolina's Sam Perkins, which was won by Georgetown and Ewing made the first shot of the game from the baseline. However, it was on defense that Ewing set the tone. The Hoyas freshman center was called for goaltending four times to give North Carolina their first eight points of the game. Georgetown coach John Thompson ordered Ewing to make his presence known on defense and not to worry about goaltending calls when attempting to, shot to block shots. North Carolina did not physically make a shot until 8.08 had passed, at which point the score was 12-10 in favor of Georgetown. Eric Sleepy Floyd proceeded to score four consecutive baskets for the Hoyas, while Worthy made six shots for the Toy Heels to tie the game at 22. The score at halftime was 32-30 in favor of the Hoyas, with 10 of North Carolina's points coming off five goaltending calls on Ewing. Both teams traded baskets for the majority of the second half, with the largest advantage being four points by Georgetown, with over 12 minutes to go in the game. And with, after five more minutes of gameplay, North Carolina, to, North Carolina managed to cut the lead to two, 56-54. The Tor Heels then gained a one-point lead with, 50, with five minutes and 50 seconds to play and set up in their four corners offense to run out the clock. The Tar Heels were quickly fouled and point guard Jimmy Black converted two free throws while Fred Brown made two, his own, two in his own on the other end to bring the score to 59-58 to in favor of North Carolina. With three and a half minutes left in the contest, Michael Jordan, who was quiet up to this point, drove to the basket and made a layup high off the backboard to increase the Tar Heels lead to three, 61-58. On Georgetown's following possession, Ewing made a jump shot along the baseline to bring his team to within one. North Carolina again set up the four corners while making an attempt to steal the ball for Matt Doherty. The Hoyas Eric Smith was called for the foul. This sent Doherty to the line for a one and one, which he missed, and Ewing got the rebound. Floyd then hit a 12-foot 12 12 jump shot with 57 seconds left to give Georgetown the lead 61 to 60, 62 to 61. After running down the clock, Jordan received a pass from Black and connected on a shot with 15 seconds left, 15 seconds remaining, to give North Carolina a one-point lead. On the Hoyas' ensuing possession, the Hoyas did not call timeout and exploded the ball up the court. Fred Brown mistakenly passed the ball to Worthy, who was over, who was over defending a pass and was accidentally and Brown accidentally threw him the pass, who proceeded to run some of the clock before being fouled by Smith. Because the official called an intentional foul, Worthy received two free throw attempts, both of which he missed. Floyd got the rebound and attempted a last second shot that also missed. Dean Smith and North Carolina Tory Hills had their elusive national championship, their first in a quarter of a century. As for Georgetown, the Hoyas will respond and return to the Final Four just two seasons later and win the national championship in dominating fashion over Olajuwon and Houston in the 1984 Final Four in Seattle. So that does it for this show, and guys, thank you for listening, and don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast, and also feel free to drop us a line here at historically.speaking.sports at gmail.com, or check us out on our Twitter page at historicallysp2. So until next time, sports fans, thank you guys for listening, and I'll catch you later.
We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.